Well, um, it's an honour to be asked to speak and a pleasure to meet so many old friends. Um, I'm a bit of a fraud to be here as far as Sells is concerned because I've only played a small role in it despite some of the kind things that were said this morning. I've really been a caretaker sort of two and a half times. I was a caretaker um, after Alan and before John and I was a caretaker on and off for Catherine. I can't remember the exact years, 2008-9 I think and 12-13, something like that. Um, and really all I did was keep it going on what was essentially the Alan Dashwood model, which was the way it's basically gone since with the seminars and the yearbooks and the periodic conferences and so forth. Of course, it had its incidents. We had the annual visit to the institutions. And when I think back with the one that I was involved in, I makes me think of Adrian Mole's school trip to the uh, British Museum, which some of you may remember. Things that went wrong um, weren't quite as exciting as when Catherine had to organise one from Southampton, but I'll get her to tell you about that over tea or maybe dinner. Um, <laughs> but I know one of the things, we, we arranged the accommodation for them, and one of the things that uh, we asked all the people who were going to do was to fill in a form which they said who they'd like to share a room with. <laughs> and um, Diane Abraham, I think it was, said to me, we've got a problem here. Mr. X has filled in a form to say he'd like to share a room with Miss Y. <laughs> Miss Y doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we had, we booked the Eurostar travel both ways, but we found coming back, I think it was, we booked on the wrong day. <laughs> but Christophe Illion was the um, deputy director, and he was on the trip, and he's a Breton. Unfortunately, the person in the Eurostar office in, in uh, Paris or Brussels, I forgot which now it must have been Brussels, was also a Breton, and Bretons get on well, so it was able to sort it out. Um, my slant for cells, and so far as I put any on it, was the EU and criminal law, and that was really because of my total ignorance about any other part of EU law, to be honest. Um, running cells, it made me think of some line from Yes Minister where some civil servant said, of course I didn't read economics at university. I wouldn't be head of the economic division if I had. <laughs> um, of course, um, I went to through the law school before the UK had joined the EU and when there wasn't any in the syllabus and I just picked it up bits and pieces since. And um, my way into the EU and criminal law was thanks to being recruited to work on a project to do with euro fraud, which produced what got known as the Corpus Juris Project, proposing a European public prosecutor. I only got recruited to that because I was an English criminal lawyer, knew about English criminal law and criminal procedure and criminal evidence, and because I could work in French and all the meetings were in French. And I had my share of meetings in excruciating rooms with noisy um, air conditioning, with everybody trying to talk French as a second language and the Italian not having done what he was supposed to do and volubly explaining why he hadn't and people having to arrive late and people going early it astonishes me we got anything done at all but we did and I'll mention more about uh, the Corpus Juris project in a minute and thinking back to the things we did in cells I'd just like to mention one which I think was really quite important at least for a time I was contacted by Lord Justice Thomas, as he then was, as somebody I'd known for a long time, and he said, I'm very concerned about the fact that the UK doesn't seem to have any coordinated approach to the EU criminal law, which is a growing field. As far as I can see, 
different government departments deal individually with different aspects of it. Nobody seems to have any direction. And um, it would be very helpful if we could have some kind of interchange, not only between academics and the civil servants involved, but also between the different civil servants involved. Any idea? And through cells, we set up a meeting. It took place in the Diamond at Selwyn. And we had academic lawyers who were interested in criminal law and people from the civil service who'd been unaware of one another's existence but who happened to have the brief to deal with the EU aspect of something, EU criminal law aspect of something they were dealing with. And they all exchanged telephone numbers and... Um, Lord Justice Thomas was there, of course, maybe other people from the judiciary as well. And thereafter, we used, there was the John Thomas group, which met for a number of years when there was a kind of show-and-tell periodically in the Royal Courts of Justice when the civil servants involved in doing it all got together and people from the judiciary and academics. And it was all very helpful. And it was all fine until the shutters came down under the coalition and civil servants weren't allowed to talk to anybody about all this because it was politically sensitive and it all very sadly fizzled out. Well, that's a bit about how I got into cells and a bit about how I got into the EU and criminal law. With the Corpus Juris project, um, interesting linguistically, just a sideline, I got recruited just because I could work in French and um, the person who was driving the project was Mireille de Nasmarty, eminent French lawyer, so it was all in French. And there were several iterations of this project. The, the next one, she'd been in Cambridge for a bit, and she'd mastered oral French, and she said it can be in French or English. And the next iteration of it, people did use French or English as they chose and then the third iteration of it was when we had what were then the candidate countries involved, and officially it was French or English, but the candidate countries, with the exception of the Poles, where there was an elderly Polish lady who much preferred French to English, it was all in English. And then finally a later iteration of it, it was all in English, and that was the gradual shift. And is that how it's going to be after Brexit? I don't know. Well, anyway, I was asked to talk about... Um, Europe and criminal justice, and that's what I'm now going to talk about, though it will have periodic references back to cells and things that happened here. I'm going to talk about why EU criminal law, what is EU criminal law, what was the UK's part in the development of the matter, and lastly and fourthly, what's going to be the UK's relationship with EU and criminal law in the future. And I'm aware that in this expert body, a lot of you will know already better than I do quite a bit of what I'm going to say, and please excuse me for the points where I'm just telling you things you know extremely well. The UK and European criminal justice. Two views. There's the same view <laughs> and the not quite <laughs> so sane view. The not quite so sane view on EU criminal justice is one of the Euromyths. You know about Euromyths? I mentioned one this morning about the, the floods and the cause of the floods and the excellent Euromyth website which Catherine tipped me off about, and I look at occasionally when I want some black humour, and here are some things that have appeared on it over the years. Really did, in bits and bits. <laughs> EU is about to ban corgi dogs, the favourite pet of Her Majesty the Queen, of course. They're about to ban double-decker buses, the public symbol of London. Did you know that? Under EU law, it's illegal to bury dead pets unless you pressure cook them first. <laughs> I mean, this really has appeared in our press, without correction, of course. The EU is going to ban barristers' wigs, and, particularly relevant to present discussions, Brussels has a secret plan to abolish the common law and make us have the Napoleonic system. You might think that's too stupid even to mention, 
But it's one of those things that recurs again and again in the press, and it certainly appeared big time as one of the arguments why we had to leave the EU. Um, here are two front pages from the Daily Express during that period. Exclusive Brussels plot to impose Euro law after EU referendum, a threat to our freedom. EU power, <coughs> power grab, terrifying Brussels plot to replace our police and judges with Euro stooges, etc., etc. Um, the Corpus Juris project was a reaction to the problem of dealing with fraud on EU finances, which at the time was investigated by a body that's now known as OLAF, which is an EU anti-fraud agency. It was part of the investigation. But when it's investigated, all it can do is hand the dossier over to the public prosecutor of the relevant, relevant member state if they can work out which one or ones it is. And all too typically, unfortunately, then that results in a game of not pass the parcel when you hope the music's going to stop in front of you. So you unwrap it and get the parcel, but pass the bomb when you pass it on as quickly as possible. Nobody really wanted to know. And our group was charged with trying to think up a solution which might work if there was a political will to do it. And we thought up the idea of a public pro European public prosecutor with authority to prosecute for Euro fraud operating under a set of rules relating to Euro fraud which should apply throughout all member states and for the purpose of prosecuting them having some common rules of procedure. All very sensible, we thought. But it got traduced in the British press, leading with the Daily Telegraph, as this being the Brussels plot to overthrow the common law. Looking back, it was at the period when Boris Johnson was their correspondent at Brussels and started to telegraph down the route of getting incredibly inaccurate stories about the EU in the Telegraph, which is supposed to be a suitable paper. And just try, see what comes up if you start Googling Corpus Juris. EU Corpus Juris. The nightmare begins. Corpus Juris, corrupt justice, blah, 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 blah. My favourite one of all, that one. Well, that's the popular conception of what EU criminal law is all about, and I'm afraid it was one of the things which wasn't corrected during the build-up to the referendum and did damage. What's it really about? Why, it, why is there any EU criminal law? Well, you know all about the four freedoms, don't you? Freedom of, work, freedom of movement of workers, of services, of goods, and of capital. And unfortunately, it leads to a fifth freedom, free <laughs> movement of criminals and crime. An unfortunate, necessary consequence. To make the most obvious thing, much easier transport of travel means it's much easier for somebody to commit a crime in country one and skip across the border to country two than it used to be. Slightly less obviously, it's much easier for people across borders to commit trans-border crimes. Even less obviously, it sometimes gives rise to new forms of criminality which you previously didn't have, fraud on the EU finances. Obviously, um, the EU depends on raising money through taxes and then it dishes it out in subsidies mainly, contrary to the popular view, which is it just disappears into a sort of black hole in Brussels that it's spent, spent by um, officials having a corrupt lifestyle. And you can make yourself rich by either not paying what you should in or by getting out what you shouldn't have or if you're really clever, managing to do both at once. And the growth of EU criminal law has been a reaction to that trying to find more efficient ways of dealing with crime, which tends to be much more transborder in a body where borders matter less. And what does it consist of? What is EU criminal law? Well, it might sound like something like a federal code in the US, something above the national ones, but it isn't yet and may never become so. It's a body of law about a number of different things. Agencies set up to try and coordinate activities. Europol, for example, 
Eurojust, which is a public prosecutor's version of Europol, neither have any powers to prosecute anybody or to investigate, but they an information store and so on. Um, OLAF, which I mentioned, which investigates the EU frauds, agencies of that sort. Secondly, it's a body of EU instruments designed to facilitate cooperation between police forces in the investigation of crimes. Just to give you one example out of many, joint investigation teams. They can operate um, under the benefit of an EU instrument under which a joint team can be set up, which then means that the police officers from the different countries can operate with authority within other countries which might, by their national rules, only allow their own national police officers to investigate and take actions and so on. A lot of these police cooperation measures are about information sharing between police, a lot of them too. Thirdly, a body of legal instruments about mutual recognition headed, of course, by the one everybody knows about, the European Arrest Warrant, which is a system of quick and simplified extradition, as between the member states. Traditionally, extradition between one country and another was a matter of asking for a favour, which was granted in the discretion of the other side. Please, could you possibly help us? We would like so-and-so back. Look, when you've got time, and if you feel like it, and provided it doesn't, doesn't contravene this and this and this national rule, could you just help us get him back, please? And the other country would say, well, maybe we'll look about it, look at it, and it would ultimately be a political decision. And maybe the person would be politically protected in some way and he wouldn't be handed over. And all that changed. Almost automatic recognition of extradition requests from legal authorities between member states. And it's the first of a list of mutual recognition measures under which rules and orders of the criminal jurisdictions and criminal authorities in different member states can be more or less automatically enforced in the others. A system which had basically been going in civil justice, of course, for years before, um, but it was something new and striking when it started to happen in criminal justice. Then harmonising criminal law, a group of EU instruments attempting to produce a common approach to particular issues in particular social issues which need this criminal law to deal with them. People trafficking, people smuggling, bribery and that sort of thing. EU instruments on all of these trying to introduce a common standard, usually rather vaguely drafted, and the main thing they contain is every member state must make it a, a criminal offence punishable with at least a maximum penalty of so much, the minimum maximum penalty that everybody must have. Not a minimum penalty for everybody, but everybody must make it serious enough that it could be punished with X. And people complain about the possible influence, oh dear, we've been Europeanised by this, but in fact the UK has done quite a lot of exporting you look at any of these instruments, you'll find standard in it is there must be criminal liability of legal persons. That's something that grew up in the common law world, was unknown or thought to be contrary to principle in a lot of continental Europe. Its flavour of the month with the EU and all these instruments have required member states, not liking it very much, some of them, to introduce criminal liability of legal persons for the things which are in the list. And lastly, the group of measures harmonising aspects of criminal procedure, starting with decent treatment for victims of crimes through all member states, and then moving on to attempts to guarantee certain minimum rights for defendants in criminal justice, particularly affecting people who would be tried in the courts of something other than their home country, for things like minimal right to interpreters and so forth. Um, to try to... You might think it was a good thing just to have that anyway, but the reason for having it was always put forward as, look, to make mutual recognition work, to make sure member states really 
do do what they say and send people back for trial in the other member state. They have to have confidence they're going to get a decent deal when they get there. So the EU must do its best to raise standards appropriately through the different um, legal systems in the other member states. And that's what EU law currently consists of. Bodies of legal rules about those one, two, three, four, five different things. Where does the law come from? Well, I expect you know better than I do. It all started with Schengen. Schengen, getting rid of border posts, no stopping people on borders, very much easier movement of timbers across borders. Part of the Schengen package was enhanced police cooperation to deal with it, and a repressive package is built into Schengen to try to compensate for the extra free movement of criminals that was going to result. That's the first gobbit of EU criminal law. Then secondly, under Maastricht and the third pillar, there were, um, it was created the possibility for the EU old form to create instruments um, affecting criminal justice that would have to be given effect in all member states within limits. A very weak and bland menu in 1992, but made to contain something which was much more important in 1997, namely the framework decision, a bit like a directive, but in the EU area under which member states were required to carry out this, that, or the other, rather than being able to decide if they actually felt like it. What was the EU's role in all of this? Well, basically, the big push forward in EU criminal law corresponded with the Blair years. Um, to go back to something I should have mentioned before, a new legal framework for the creation of EU criminal law with the process communitarized under Lisbon, which is where we are now. But yes, what I meant to be, the UK's involvement well, during the Blair, year, the Blair years corresponded with EU criminal law really getting going. And the Blair government was pro-European. It was also very pro-law and order. You may remember Tony Blair managed to win the 1997 election partly by playing down the Labour Party's traditional position on criminal justice, which was... it's. Social deprivation causes people to commit crimes. Um, we want to prove social conditions and crimes will fall away. You mustn't be hard on them to satirise the traditional left wing position. And Tony Blair discovered that that was taking votes away, so he invented that slogan when he was shadow home secretary, didn't he? New Labour, tough on crime and on the causes of crime in tiny letters. <laughs> and the, they were very authoritarian in the sort of things they pushed forward during that period. And they were really in there in pushing forward for new measures post-Amsterdam. The UK was in the forefront of the European arrest warrant, for example, and the other mutual recognition measures and the police cooperation measures and something else, I bet some of you didn't know this, Schengen, you know we're not part of Schengen, as you curse every time you have to queue up at the airports and so on. Well, we're not in the free movement part, but under the Blair, we discovered there was some nice repressive bits, so the Blair government went to the EU and said, look, could we come into the repressive bits, please? We're not opening our borders, but can we be in the repressive bits? And they let us into the repressive bits, so the UK got into the repressive bits of Schengen, um, under the Blair government. There were some things they didn't like. They didn't like the European Public Prosecutor proposal when that was first floated in 1997, but nor did any other member state then, and so the UK wasn't out of step over that. Towards the end of the Blair years, I regret to say the UK put a spanner in the works to stop the development of any more defence-favourable harmonisations of criminal justice. We were in there to begin with, and all of a sudden we changed our mind and we went cold on it, and we used our political muscle to stop there being any more of it. And of course, unanimity was then required, so we sprang it by doing that. Why? Nobody ever explained, but I'm pretty sure it was that we had a very populist um, 
program of reform of criminal justice, put victims at the top, etc. And <laughs> there was a move even to try to reduce defendants' rights of appeal in criminal cases, and they didn't want all that to be diluted with a headline saying, Brussels gives criminals more rights, or anything like that. And then, at the end of the um, Labour period, after Tony Blair had gone, and it was a question of signing up to Lisbon, we extracted two big opt-outs from criminal justice under the new arrangement. I'll tell you more about them in a minute. Why did we extract them? Certainly for national political reasons. The Labour Party promised a referendum on the EU constitution when it won the election in 2005. It had then seen referenda going the wrong way in different other countries in Europe. It absolutely didn't want to have one on the Lisbon Treaty, but it went the wrong way in the UK. So Gordon Brown had to be able to dress it up for internal purposes as not changing anything. And the two things it really would have changed was the position in criminal justice. So we had to have opt-outs to try and keep that the same. But apart from that, if you want to sum up the UK's part in developing EU criminal law during the Labour years, it's that. Forward with Europe in repression, basically. But then, from 2010 to 2015, we had the coalition years, and, well, there you are. One of them, wasn't it? Um, and you had the Conservatives with increasing um, plight in the Eurosceptic wing of it, not wanting to cooperate with anything in Europe. You had Theresa May, who was Home Secretary, who wanted to cooperate, go on cooperating on the repressive stuff, and the Lib Dems, who were up for all of it. The result was we had a very muddled period of years in reacting to EU criminal law policy initiatives to start with. Basically, we started being favourable to them, and we ended up refusing to have anything more to do with any of them at the end of the coalition period. I'm going to tell you about the Protocol 36 fiasco and the lead up to it. Some of you will know already a lot about this. Um, under Maastricht, the measures that were adopted had to be adopted by unanimity. Criminal justice measures had to be adopted by unanimity of the member states, which meant every country, including the UK, could veto one, national veto on any measure. And there was no enforcement through the courts, so you had a framework decision under which the member states were required to carry it out, but nothing could be done legally against them if they just didn't. It all depended on informal pressures being applied to them in that sort of way by the other member states. And in the Lisbon Treaty, we extracted two opt-outs. One was in Protocol 21. No EU justice measures apply to us unless we decide to opt into them. So that was to maintain the position we had before with a national veto, basically. And secondly, we were worried, or purported to be worried, about the fact that under the Lisbon Treaty the EU Court of Justice was going to require full jurisdiction over the criminal law area, not only for future measures, but also in respect of the Maastricht measures from a date mentioned. And with that in mind, in Protocol 36, Article 10, Clause 4, we got the right to pull out of all the surviving Maastricht measures ahead of the CJEU getting power to implement, power to enforce them. And that was just simply meant to make the Lisbon Treaty palatable without a referendum, or the absence of a referendum palatable. But it got discovered by the Tory Eurosceptics, who, not the brightest of people, thought that it was somehow the means of disconnecting the UK from the EU in criminal law matters. And that was all taken up by the Sun and taken up by the Daily Telegraph. And there was pressure on David Cameron to exercise the Protocol 36 opt-out. And in, December, in September 2012, at a trade conference in Brazil, he was asked by 
a journalist, what are you going to do about that opt-out on criminal justice? He said, oh, we're going to do it. We're going to do it by the end of the year. Don't worry. Gasp. And of course, having said it, they pledged and they had to. I like this slide. I've used it a number of times. This was a line. This was a headline from The Sun on something else. <laughs> David Cameron's knack for speaking without engaging his brain is a nasty habit. Well, he sure did it on that occasion, didn't he? Bigger mistake was later to follow. And the so we did exercise the Protocol 36 uh, uh, um, opt-out. And the final end of it all was that we opted out of all the measures, or out of all of it, so we opted back into all the measures that actually mattered, including all the ones that the Eurosceptics particularly disliked, namely the European Arrest Warrant, and we just ditched the ones that didn't make any difference. Value of the exercise will derisively Yvette Cooper in Parliament in the debate when Cameron had said, you know, we've clawed back all these powers from Brussels, said that. We now have the power not to do a whole series of things we plan to go Harry on doing anyway. The power not to follow guidance we already follow. The power not to take action we already take. The power not to meet standards we already meet. The power not to do things that everyone else has stopped doing already. And the power not to do a whole series of things we want to do anyway. Well, there you are. Um, I and others... Um, Alithia Hinarechos, who sadly not here today, and Steve Pears, wrote a, an analysis of what the Maastricht criminal law was and what we'd lose if we opted out, and Cells helped us do it and helped us publish it, and that's another of my involvements with Cells, and I'm very grateful for Cells' support. So what's the UK's current position following the Protocol 36 fiasco? Well, we're in the new agencies that were created for the moment, not in the European Public Prosecutor. We've said we're not going to have anything to do with that. I can tell you more about that um, Different questions if anybody wants to know. We opted back into all the police cooperation measures. We opted back into all the mutual recognition measures, basically. We opted out of all the Maastricht harmonising criminal law measures, except for child porn. Um, so the UK is now free to legalise bribery and terrorism and all these other things that Tories are so keen on, on legalising. Um, and we're in some of the criminal law, some of the criminal procedure bits like victims, um, and about one of the defence right ones, but we're basically out of it. So we're sort of part way in, part way out at the moment, much more in than out. What's going to be the position in the future after Brexit, assuming Brexit happens, as I think we must, must assume? Well, we don't really know very clearly what the government's going to seek to negotiate, but back last February... Theresa May caused the government to publish a white paper saying what she hoped we were going to get. And we will continue to work with the EU to preserve UK and European security and to fight terrorism and uphold justice across Europe, she said. The safety of the UK public is a top priority for the government. Our pre-existing security relationship with the EU and its member states, that we are uniquely placed to develop and sustain a mutually beneficial model of cooperation in this area from outside the Union. We've been such good boys on all of this in the past. They love us so much. <laughs> they roll over and let us have anything. Well, there you are. Um, I spoke with somebody I know in, I won't tell you which member state, but a lawyer in one of the ministers of justice in one of the member states who said, I read that and my blood boiled. He said, you've been really awkward people to deal with on criminal justice. You wanted exceptions from anything. You've turned us inside out over the Protocol 36 fiasco which all amounted to nothing in the end. We've made endless concessions to you to keep you on side. Well, now you're going out 
don't expect any concessions on anything except where they're of benefit to us. We will be giving you a deal, but it's one that benefits us, not you. And I suspect that the uh, I suspect that that's going to be the position of the 27 member states. We will be able to do some kind of deal on EU criminal law insofar as it's perceived to be of benefit to the rest of the EU, but not otherwise. We know what Theresa May wants to keep, the repressive packages, basically. How much of EU criminal law could we actually keep and how post-Brexit? Membership of EU agencies... We could, well, things like Eurojust and Europol do allow desks, rather poor quality desks, in a corner to be occupied by um, associate members from other countries like the Ukraine and the US and so on. And I think we could expect to be given one of those. But the difference is that it's only the actual members of the College of Europol, which are the representatives of the member states, who's again to decide what goes on. Who is the current director of Europol? Answer, a Brit, Robert Wainwright, who's been doing it for years and has managed to mould it all our way considerably. Ditto with Eurojust. We've actually had two directors of Eurojust. We won't have any more, will we? You'll have a desk in the corner. And to quote the Remainer slogan, but turning it round, it's the EU which will take back control. On police cooperation measures and mutual recognition, I think I can do with them. Well, we will have to make deals either with the EU collectively or with the individual member states. With the individual member states, if you add up all the measures that the Cameron government wanted to go back into and you multiply them by 27, I think it comes to something like 794 different instruments if we did it individually. So we have to try and get some kind of collective deal. And it might be possible, <coughs> optimists point to the uh, council decision extending a version of the EU arrest, of the mutual of the European arrest warrant to Norway and Iceland, under which they are bound by the Court of Justice decisions where they agree to listen to them with respect or something. We could do that, couldn't we? The trouble is, that decision was made in, I think, 2006, and it's still not in force because it had to be ratified by all the member states, and some of them haven't. Now, it's possible that the other member states would give a greater priority to ratifying some deal with the UK as being a more likely destination for their criminals to run after than Iceland. I mean, I guess if it's Iceland, you might think, well, what does it matter if he has to spend the rest of his life in Iceland? <laughs> Serves him right, doesn't it? But the UK it might be another matter. So we might be able to get some special deals. But I see difficulties. Theresa May, before the 2015 election, was all up for ditching the European Convention on Human Rights. She's now said, no, no, I've kicked that into the long grass, but it's plain she'd love to get rid of it, and the Tory Eurosceptics would love it a for sure. I. So you may well find that we're told we can stay in those measures as long as we guarantee to stay in the European Convention, and so on and so on. So something could be done, probably. There are other international conventions. There are, e there are European Council of Europe conventions in some of these areas, which we could fall back on if we don't get any special deals. So there's the EU Council, Council of Europe um, Extradition Convention, which is what we operate with countries like Norway and so on at the moment. Um, but they're nothing like as good. For example, um, contracting parties under those can refuse to hand over their nationals. And that's a real bind. There's a saying in international criminal law, out, out dedere, out judicare, either hand them over or try them themselves. So the countries which, like, exercise that rule and say, OK, Metropolitan Police, we'll try our German for rape, but we've got to do it here. So send the victim over and all the evidence and everything will be prosecuted here. And, of course, very, very difficult to do. Harmonising criminal law will be opted out of nearly all those measures um, and we're likely not to want to go back into them. We don't... The UK, most of these measures say we must punish at least this with at least this severity. 
But if you look at English substantive criminal law compared with the criminal law anywhere else in continental Europe, you find it punishes more things and it has higher maximum penalties with a high penalty champions of Europe, really, so it won't change anything. And anyway, we are bound by other international treaties to um, prohibit most of the things that these prohibit. Harmonizing criminal procedure, heaven knows, we'll probably try not to go back into any of these in any way, but we might well find that we have to, as the price of doing the deals that we'd like to do on the police cooperation and mutual recognition. Something will come out of it, but it will be on terms of mutual interest with the rest of the EU, rather than their desire, actually, to keep us on side, I'm sure. Well, thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and it's now time for the discussion. interesting in both presentations was a discussion of responsible language and the way in which sort of English suddenly became to dominate uh, as the kind of the main language of discussion for all these reasons. Now in the context then of the UK leaving many of these institutions, how, how do you think the language dimension of some of these uh, issues is going is going to change. Is is it one thing that we're is that going to be our, our, the legacy that that the English language remains the, the the main language of discussion in these different forums of discussion, or is is there going to be a language takeover? I don't know. Maybe Angela, who is at the court, might be able to tell us. In practical terms, English is the new Latin, and um, it's the what's it called? transport language or something for a great many people who can talk enough of it to communicate with one another, even though their native tongues are Finnish and Danish or whatever it is. Um, I suppose the English language will remain one of the official languages of the EU because there are other countries where it's ALD official language, <coughs> even though the UK is not a member. My guess is that it will continue to exercise a strong influence just because there are so many <coughs> people who will be participating in the enterprise who are much easier in it than in French, which would presumably be the alternative, or maybe even German. I don't know. I can see as far into a crystal ball. Uh, it's probably, well, it's not English, English. It's going to, it's the, as you say, the English spoken by the, the thin to a Dane in the airport lounge. Um, and that changes the sort of vocabulary and the terminology. It will develop it, it will develop a kind of autonomous, I mean, it is already developing the internet and whatever, an autonomous character. I think for comparative lawyers, that's going to, it, it's one thing to have it as a language of discussion, a reference point. It, as a sort of neutral Esperanto type of language, but it still doesn't get you away from the problem of you can't, it's very difficult to do the contextual stuff unless you can actually dig down into the local language. Um, and that, that I think is going to be the big issue. In a sense, the more you expand the range of countries that you want to compare, the bigger your problem and the bigger the teams that you need to put in place to enable. So um, I, I think, I think it, 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 it and, and, and to some extent, as, as I said in my presentation, the deficiencies of the, particularly the English education system on modern languages is actually going to put a lot of English people at severe disadvantage. Just to the discount to something that John said at the beginning, English in the EU form, there are certain usages of words and to us misusages of words, which I've noticed recurrent in documents emanating from the EU, particularly one that comes to mind, 
We want to say in English, this law requires this out of the other done, this law lays down this and this, you see, this law provides such and such. If you read an EU document, it will say, this law foresees this, that, and the other. Now that's the translation of prévoir in French, which I suppose has both meanings, but um, that's, so there's going to be a strange version of English. Yeah. Uh, Marcus, then, yeah, there's, there's a great list of common mistakes. I think the, the Library of the Court put it out uh, last year, um, pointing out where the Euro-English version is, is different from uh, British English. John, I had a question, uh, John Spencer, I had a question for you on, um, so assuming the UK crashes out in March 2019, and then uh, the new um, Johnson administration tries to rapidly renegotiate uh, some form of arrangement, or maybe even tries to re-enter. Can you see a situation where the other member states will say, you had one fantastic ride of exceptions, if you want to be part of this again, you will have to accept the whole body, the acquis in EU criminal law before we move forward with you. Yes, I can. The only thing, as I said, the end is, there is mutual interest. The Germans are going to want to get their criminals back from us. They're going to want to get evidence in this country to prosecute the, their evildoers in Germany, um, and so on and so forth. So there may be some concessions given in order to avoid the UK becoming the Brazil of Europe, um, which would not be ha happy for the rest of the EU, even less happy for us, of course. <laughs> of course, we're not, we're not the only country which has had strange relationships with the criminal justice. I mean, Denmark have voted to leave Europol and has caused uh, a lot of problems. So uh, at least we're not alone uh, in, in our shenanigans. But um, yeah, I was going to make a few thoughts in response to, to John Bell's uh, really great paper. Uh, I think in your previous work you've described um, comparative law as a normative social science and in a way that seems right in the sense that the analytical work which is being done is syncretic in the sense it's both trying to kind of explain um, almost empirically, but I don't think that in a, in a strong sense to introduce the service at it, but in a sense empirically why we see different patterns in different jurisdictions. And then it has this normative angle which is um, trying to, to, to look at actually functionally which works uh, better or worse, but always with an eye also on what's practically realistic in terms of, of law reform. Um, I suppose my, my question would be how you see that balance or that syn synthesis uh, going forward in the discipline. Okay. I mean, in a sense, the descriptive analytical is the easier one and fits very much um, with um, sociology, political science, and so on. But um, there is that other bit of legal science generally, and, 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 and I just remember in a comparative methodology conference, a psychologist saying, well, isn't all that lawyers do um, to analyse or predict what's in the minds of judges, what judges think or might do. So as it were, rather than law as, a, 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 as a, what people ought to do, if law is about what people ought to do, comparative law shares that question that lawyers have about what is the right thing to do. Um, and it comes, so it's, it's answering a common question among other branches of law um, with the evidence provided by looking at a problem from different angles and coming up to a judgment. But that judgment is based on political, philosophical, and other things about which we, uh, standards about which we have to be clear. Um, and I think comparative lawyers quite often fight 
fight shy of that bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that is why probably too much comparative law remains at the descriptive level, because it's easy in one sense to put it together in an explanatory form and then say, OK, what do we do about it? Well, not my job. Um, and I think the, the normative side is when we contribute to a debate. But at that point, we have only limited um, standing because other people have got other normative perspectives that can challenge it. We can, our evidence base is one part of the jigsaw. So it, that's, I think, where the collaboration comes as part of a team of people with different expertise. And you don't need all the members of the team to have knowledge of the particular legal systems. They need to be able to read the results and then come to a debate. Can I build on that? I mean, you have been a member of a network of European Supreme Court judges. Mm. Do you see them actually doing comparative law, using it, and, and shoot them? I think they do. I mean, when, I, that's why I was saying a lot of the stuff upstream of the European Convention. That would probably the most interesting debate was, was in the Strasbourg Court, when you've got Supreme Court judges from Italy, France, Germany, um, Strasbourg, Luxembourg, uh, others sitting around the table with the registrar of the court and talking off the record about some of the problems they had. One of the problems which they one of the court judges had subsequently became a Strasbourg case. Um, and that you already got you know, the, the sense of you know, dealing with a problem, what's the right, what's the best way of handling it, taking account of all the different standards in the I mean, just to sort of come back a little bit on, on the, the script, what, what you're calling descriptive, it seems that, that good comparative work often goes sort of rather deeper than simply descriptive on the, on the non-normative side, because you need to understand how deep or shallow the differences are in terms of what's practically possible for cooperation or harmonization. If, in fact, the differences are skin deep, then, in fact, a lot more is possible in terms of law reform or suggestions. If, in fact, it's deeply entrenched, for example, in national human cultures, then um, it's not probably possible. But that, that, that is quite analytical in a way. It's, it's not a simple description. And I think we are seeing some of that kind of work on the comparatively. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right about the context, but the contextual often requires you to work with people who are not lawyers to get to the grips with what, you know, if we take, you know, John John's area is a very good area to look on because the criminal justice system involves a lot of institutions, a lot of practices and so on. And, you know, the work that sort of John's team were able to do is not just look at rules, but just to understand, you know, why it takes the time is to understand what, how does the system work and what's, what's going on, and where does the problem crop up? Where are the difficulties? Um, and they may crop up in all sorts of different ways. I don't know whether you wanted to comment on that, John, because you know, your area is a very good area for that. Something of great interest is how, apparently, very broad, the area of liability is in English criminal law for preliminary acts before crimes, for example, and conspiracy, um, and as well as definitions of actual offences themselves, and such depth, very, very hard to define, and how very narrow a lot of the defences are, refusals to accept a defence of necessity in cases of euthanasia, for example. And, and the other side of that is, we have a discretion to prosecute, hugely used, and we have um, jury equity, which is regarded as a good value by most people rather than an abuse, under which juries could just rebel and quit against the teeth of the law. The only reason I'm quite sure we've never reformed our law relating to mercy killing is the knowledge that juries would perversely acquit and in consequence the director of public prosecutions either doesn't prosecute at all or 
um, accepts a guilty plea to manslaughter in the knowledge that the court will give some very lenient sentence. You can't really understand, you look at English criminal law on paper, this is horrendous. But then you take into account the institutions that surround it, and it works out in a relatively civilised, if sometimes rather haphazard way. So that's what you see from uh, And whereas Italian law has, a, a, has an obligation to prosecute. Yes, and it works like this. You also have time limits for everything in a public prosecution. Because um, of the time limits, the public prosecutor exercises his discretion by where he puts the dossier in the enormous piles on his desk. <laughs> so he lets them quietly die. You know, it probably works the same way, really. Yeah, yeah, but, it, but it's that, those sort of contextual yes. features of looking at criminal law with criminal procedure and criminal process that enables you to, to have a feel for how the system works. And I think too much of the old traditional World Congress sort of stuff looks at the rules and, and doesn't really get you to a situation where you can seriously make a question about whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to have that rule or not. Anyone for another question? We have a few minutes. If there's no one else, I, I'll, I'll just to make a brief remark about the language issue before I pose a short question. Um, an interesting thought that crossed my radar recently was that there will now be more English in the EU once the Brexit goes through than less because there's an obvious political sensitivity around any big language dominating the system. So if you have a big language but the front of the country isn't a member, then that the, takes the heat out of the, out of the political sensitivity. So ironically, you might see more English used in EU institutions after the Brexit than, than before. Um, as far as the court is concerned, the court will never change from French, ever. I can't, I can't see that happening. Um, but in the terms of the question I wanted to, to, to ask, I was at a conference just last week about the new EU data protection regulation. A police officer gave a very interesting presentation and he spoke in favour of um, the exceptions to data protection, the regulation being interpreted broadly because there are so many crimes now that are committed purely on the internet. And that in order to collect evidence, then the exceptions to data protection in his view needed to be interpreted broadly. John, in all these, in all of your involvement in the whole process here in the UK, both before and after Brexit, is there, has there been any focus at all on this contemporary problem we have now of the internet? and crimes being committed across borders probably more commonly now than ever before because of the use of technology and how this is affecting the UK's relationship with Europe. Is that featured as part of the discussion? I'm out of my depth, so I won't waffle too long. As Boris Johnson once said, I'd like permission to obfuscate. Um, the, the EU harmonisation of criminal law instruments typically deal with offences with transporter elements. And they typically deal with them by requiring the member states to make jurisdictional rules that enable them to exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction. So make sure that they can prosecute, the courts of this country can prosecute people for it, even though it happened in Italy or even though the person says it was really done in Italy. We tried to get around it that way. Trouble is, though, as um, one of the writers on all this has said, potentially results in a sort of Wild West result. Whichever member state starts first is the one that ends up dealing with it, and sometimes they're not the most appropriate one to do it. It was for that reason that years ago we thought what you needed was a European public prosecutor to deal with uh, prosecutions for it frauds on the EU finances, which are very often transported. Probably that's what's needed. But as far as I can answer your question, Angela, the way we've been trying to deal with it at the moment is by harmonization measures, which say someone in there or member states must make rules so that they can punish people for doing it even outside their borders. That's as far as we've got, I think. I don't know whether David can tell us. I mean, there's several data protection lawyers in the room, but I think, I think you know, that there is, there is a concern that I suspect that the, 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 the,
actually brought by David Davis at one point to promptly removed himself from the case when he became minister to exit the European Union. Um, but the Teddy to see the case uh, is a joint case where data retention laws uh, at national level were declared invalid with the EU law. And apparently the reasoning of the court was that, um, that the indefinite and, and sort of general retention of location and traffic data, even to fight serious crime and terrorism, was unacceptable because it was a violation of the fundamental right to data protection. All the data had to be stored within the EU uh, and a whole list of other things. And um, yeah, this is a concern that in fact uh, it, 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 this does threaten um, the fight against serious crime and terrorism. I mean, you know, it, 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 it is an EU measure, and it's coming from the court, and it's coming from, from, from data protection legislation. Um, uh, and fundamental rights jurisprudence does sometimes point to some strange results. Uh, I do worry that the court and, and some of the people who, who made these decisions might not have the expertise to understand the implications of what they're saying. You know, it's saying that you know, indefinite retention is, is, is unacceptable, full stop. Uh, and I think that the member states will try and find ways down to the judgment of the court, which they, which they often do, or not implement it. But if you read the word, which says that even to fight against serious crime, it's simply unacceptable to retain the location and traffic data in, 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 in a general way, um, you might worry that, that that might be necessary to fight serious crime. But this is just my experience. <laughs> okay, I think it's, it's time to stop the session and perhaps to continue that discussion around the coffee. Uh, thank you very much to both our speakers. I think John on my left was talking about contextualizing our understanding of rules, and John on my right was doing exactly that in his analysis, so that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you.